With that, would you please stand with me for the reading of the Word of God. This is God's Word. He entered Jericho and was passing through, and there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small of stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he was also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Father, uh, that last verse touches our hearts. What an explanation of this story, but also of the whole Bible. He came to seek and to save the lost. I pray that those who are here today and who are still in the category of the lost, would, that this would be the day that their heart would open to you. For those of us who know you and the moment has come when we have opened our heart to you, I pray that we will go away today, Father, knowing more than ever what privileged people we are and what a wonder you are. That will, uh, it will not just make us feel good, but that it will inform our lives, incentivize us to live for you. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Please turn with me, if you have not already, to Luke 19. It's a wonderful passage of Scripture. We've sort of camped here for a couple, three weeks, but it's, I guess it was too good for me to move on. I just love this story. John Bacon was an 18th uh, century British sculptor who was actually quite a talented man. And when we were in, uh, in Westminster Abbey a few years ago, uh, Westminster Abbey not only is a big church, it's just a big everything. And they've got grave sites all over for many of the kings of England there, as many of you know, if you've been able to visit. They also have grave sites of many of their most famous people. John Bacon is one of those. But what was really interesting is what was written on his tombstone at Westminster Abbey. It said this, said, what I was as an artist seemed of some importance to me while I lived. But what I was as a believer in Jesus Christ is the only thing of importance to me now. Don't you love that? It's the only thing that matters now. It's not that our lives aren't important, that they're not significant, and that what God chooses to do through us isn't important. It is. When it comes to eternity, beloved, Jesus is everything because he can do the impossible. He can do what we can never do on our own. He can save us from our sins and make us acceptable to a holy and perfect God. And this little story of how the hated and lost tax collector Zacchaeus was found is one of the most beautiful in the Bible. According to verse 9, the impossible happened. Salvation came to his house. Don't you want salvation to come to your house? It's a wonderful thing to contemplate. The whole purpose of the incarnation of Jesus becoming a man, of God coming in human flesh, the whole purpose was that in order that he might save Zacchaeus, in order that he might save John Bacon, that he might save you, and that he might save me and anyone who is willing to be found. So this story divides into three parts. The sinner, which we looked at a couple weeks ago. The Savior, which we will look at today, and the salvation. Really simple, but so profound. The whole message of the Bible is right here in this little account of Zacchaeus. So we're, today we're going to look at the Savior and the part that he plays in bringing salvation. Four parts, 
as we look at and see what it is that Jesus does as Savior. Number one, he is the initiator of salvation. He is the initiator. Notice verse one, he entered Jericho and was passing through. Sounds at, the, at first notice like it's just a, just a throwaway verse, right? It's anything but. There is no verse in the Bible that's a throwaway verse. This is here to show us the personal nature of salvation and to show us how it begins. Salvation begins with God. Now, when you go down to verse 3, you'll, say, you'll see that it says of Zacchaeus that he was seeking to see who Jesus was. And indeed, from a human perspective, that's exactly what was going on. He thought he was seeking Jesus first, but actually Jesus was seeking him first. Verse 1 comes before verse 3. Jesus was passing through, but he was passing through because he had come to seek and to save one single person, Zacchaeus. He had come to Jericho to find this man, Zacchaeus was the lost. Jesus has come to seek and to save him. And he was passing through because he knew already that Zacchaeus had left the city and had passed on to the outside of the city where he was going to try and find a way to see Jesus when he came through. So Jesus didn't stop in the city where Zacchaeus lived. He was passing through because he was focused like a laser on Zacchaeus. And he knew Zacchaeus was already outside the city. You say, man, you're reading a lot into those few words, aren't you? Well, I don't think so. Look down at verse 5. Verse 5, Jesus says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I, and I notice this word and underline it in your Bible, I must stay at your house today. I must. It's the Greek word dei, D-E-I. It's a really simple word, but it occurs often in the New Testament, and it indicates an absolute necessity. This is something that's almost lawfully required. I must come to your house today. Why? Is it a physical necessity? Of course not. There were a hundred places that Jesus could have gone, right, to spend the day. But he says, I must come to your house. Why? Because he is personally seeking this man Zacchaeus. Because this is Zacchaeus' day. He has come to Jericho for Zacchaeus. I think that is so beautiful. He's come to seek and to save the lost, and Zacchaeus is one of those lost that Jesus has come to seek and to save. Now, if you turn to John 4, if you're in Luke, just turn over a few pages to John 4. You'll see very similar wording on another occasion. It's another personal divine appointment. In John chapter 4, Beginning in verse 3, we read this. It says, And he, Jesus, left Judea, the southern part of Palestine, where Jerusalem was. He left Judea and departed again for Galilee, way up north. And he had to, you can underline that, pass through Samaria. It's the same word. It's the same word, D-E-I, the Greek word, day. He had to. It was an absolute necessity that he passed through Samaria. Now you should be asking yourself, really? We have to grant that it's the most direct way. If you're going from Judea in the south to Galilee in the north, the most direct way is to pass through Samaria. We'll grant that. But guess what? Very few Jews went that way. The Jews hated the Samaritans, and so they almost routinely turned east first if they were going out of Judea went through the Jordan River, then up north on that side, and then passed back over into Galilee. Why? Because they hated the Samaritans. They wanted nothing to do with them. And they would not be welcome there either. They were subject to all kinds of mistreatment if they were to go through Samaria. So they did not routinely go through Samaria. So why does it say Jesus had to? It was absolutely necessary that he do that because there was no other road. Of course not. There was another road. There were other roads. It wasn't a physical necessity. It was a divine necessity. He had to go through Samaria so that he could meet the woman at Jacob's well. Remember the story? How he met this woman who was an outcast from society, 
coming to get her water at noon because that's the time when the other women wouldn't be there to bother her, a woman who had lived a dissolute life, an immoral life. And Jesus met her because why? Because he came to seek and to save the lost. And she was one of the lost that he came to seek and to save. And so it was necessary that he go through Samaria. She had her divine appointment, not because there were no roads, but so that he could find the one outcast woman, just like he had to go through Jericho so that he could find Zacchaeus, whom he came to seek and to save. He came to seek and to save, beloved, for the simple reason that if he didn't, we would never find salvation. We would never on our own seek him. This passage shows us that long before Zacchaeus determined to find Jesus, Jesus had already planned to come this way. The Bible is very clear on this. If our salvation depending, depended on us being the initiators, it would never happen. Isaiah 53, verse 6 says, For, we, for all, have, all, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Not just some of us, not just a few of us, not just the worst of us, but all of us have turned to our own way. Even... Listen, even what we call seeking God, we sometimes talk about people seeking God, but even what we call seeking God is simply seeking to find a God who will fit into my agenda and to my lifestyle and what I want. Believe me, no one is looking for a God to whom to be accountable. The God of the Bible. No one goes out to seek him. That God, believe me, is not lost. That God has revealed himself, and he says so. He has revealed himself in nature. That God has revealed himself in the conscience that is within us, the law written in our hearts that tells us this is right and this is wrong, which is a, which is a, which is a tendency that isn't explainable by any natural means. God has put his law in our heart. That God is revealed in Scripture, and that God is revealed most of all in his Son. That God is not lost. The reason people don't find that God is because they are not looking for that God. They're looking for a God who will salve their conscience. They're looking for a God who will fit into their lifestyle rather than a God into whose lifestyle they must fit. That's why it's imperative that he comes to seek and to save those who are lost because we would not seek him on our own. We do not want that kind of accountability. But Jesus has come to reveal God. He has come to seek and to save the lost. He's the initiator. A fellow named Stan Telchin was a, uh, he was a uh, Jewish businessman, very successful. Sent his oldest daughter, Judy, away from college. And at the age of 21, she called home one day. And she said, uh, I've been attending this. Some of my friends had invited me to this Bible study. I've been attending it. And she said, I've come to the conclusion that Jesus is the Messiah. And I've given my life to him. That's a hard, I, I can see why she did that by phone. That would be a hard conversation to have face to face, right? Her father was spitting mad. He determined that he was, gonna, he was gonna prove her wrong and he set out to investigate everything he could find out about Jesus and everything that he could find out about the Christian faith because he was gonna prove it wrong. But even though he was seeking Jesus only to try and prove him as not being Messiah, all the evidence kept pointing in the other direction. You see, because, because while he was seeking to prove Jesus wrong, Jesus was all the time seeking him. Jesus was initiating a process. Well, Stan Telchin ended up, he, he went to a convention, a National Convocation of Messianic Jews, Messianic Jews, people... Jewish people who have come to faith in Christ and have accepted him as Messiah. He didn't go because he wanted, although he thought he might be able to extend his, his investigation there a little bit, but he mostly went for business contacts. But by the third day, he was absolutely distraught. He couldn't sleep. He couldn't eat. He had no peace of mind. He kept thinking about the things that he was hearing. Came down after a sleepless night, sat down at a table with a bunch of guys at the conference who didn't really know him, but one of them did. And he looked at him and he said, Stan, would you pray for us this morning? Well, that startled him, but he went ahead and prayed. 
This is what he prayed. He said, praise be thou, Lord God of the universe. Thank you for what we have learned at this meeting. Bless this food in the name of Jesus, the Messiah. It was out before he knew what happened. He finished the prayer. He had a startled look on his own face. Another one of the men who had known him said to him, Stan, you, you're a believer? And he said, yes, yes, I am. He realized he had come to faith in Christ. He called his wife. Later he said, you know, I've been on this investigation. He said, you know what? I've come to believe Jesus is the Messiah as well. She said, praise God. She said, we've been praying for you. She said, I've come to faith in Christ. The younger daughter had come to faith in Christ. They were all praying for him. Why? Because Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. Remember? He's the initiator of salvation. If you're a Christian today, it's because God sought you out. He's the initiator. Jesus found him. Secondly, he is the implementer. He's not only the initiator, he's the implementer. Look at verse 5. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. I mean, that's a loaded verse, but it begins to speak to how salvation was initiated in the life of Zacchaeus. And if you'll notice, it's Jesus taking all the action. We see a similar thing in Ephesians 1. If you can remember back far enough, seven years or whatever, when we were in Ephesians 1, Paul has this great, you know, tribute to God. It's a full sentence. It's a, it's a run-on sentence from verse 3 to verse 14 in Ephesians 1. It's all one sentence in the original because Paul gets so excited he forgets to put a period. He's proclaiming all that he has in Christ, and he just gets carried away. We can't, we won't read the whole thing, but let's start in verse 3. Look what he says. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Who did the blessing? He did. He blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He predestined us for adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ. We're saved not because we were smart enough to accept Christ, beloved. From, from the human standpoint, it's what it felt like. It's what it seemed like. But the implementer of salvation is Jesus. That's, that's Luke's exact point when he says, if you're back in Luke uh, Luke 19, when he says in verse 5, he says, he says, when Jesus came to the place. When Jesus came to the place. What place? A sycamore tree. So what's significant about the sycamore tree? That's where Zacchaeus was. Zacchaeus is in that sycamore tree. And when Jesus gets there, what does he do? He stops, and then he looks up. Now think about this. Jesus has passed hundreds of trees over the last two and a half years. As far as we know, he never stopped and looked up in any one of them. But at this place, at this time, he stops and he looks up. And then he does another very interesting thing. He says, Zacchaeus. Why is that interesting? Because he's never met him before in his life. It's not like he's been texting this guy and emailing him and phoning him, right? It's not like Zacchaeus is on Facebook and Jesus happened to run into him. He doesn't know who he is. From a human perspective, this is not what we would expect. You would expect him to say, what are you doing up there? And who are you, by the way? No. He says, Zacchaeus, why? Because he knows him by name and he knows exactly where to find him. And he knows that because this event didn't start this morning. This event wasn't initiated when Zacchaeus got up in the morning, heard Jesus was coming and said, man, I've got to find a way to see him. I'm going to run out of town and get ahead of everybody and find a tree. This event didn't happen when Jesus got up this morning and said, I think I'll pass through Jericho so I can get to Zacchaeus on the other side. This event was determined by God long before time began. 
Isn't that what it said in Ephesians 1? Who chose us before the foundation of the world. So long before time began, this event was determined by God. And now, all those millennia later, the time has come for the action to occur. All those hundreds of years later, the moment has come. Zacchaeus thinks he's seeking Jesus. Instead, it's Jesus who has come all the way from eternity past, who's come all the way from heaven to earth, who's come all the way from glory to a manger in Bethlehem to this road in Jericho so that he can look up into the tree and find Zacchaeus because he came to seek and to save the lost. Does that, does that give you goosebumps? It should. Because if you're a Christian today, you may not have been up in a tree and it may not have been quite this dramatic, but it is exactly the same process that has happened in your life God has sought you out specifically. God has found you wherever you were when your heart finally opened to Jesus Christ. God has initiated and then has implemented the salvation that you thought was because you were smart enough to say yes to Christ. You are chosen. You are special. You are beloved. We think we found Christ. Christ found us. That's the truth of Scripture. Jesus says, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. I must stay at your house. Why must? Because you've been chosen. You've been chosen before the foundation of the world, and now is the time. This is your time. This is your divine appointment because you've been chosen. Have you been chosen? See, that's a question I'm asking myself. Have I been? I don't know. How do I know if I've been chosen? What if I haven't been chosen? How do I know that I've been chosen? Well, if you're asking the question, chances are you've been chosen. Those who have been chosen by God say yes to Jesus Christ. So the way to make sure that you've been chosen is to say yes to Jesus Christ. Listen, the Bible consistently puts God's sovereignty and man's freedom of choice side by side. When you begin to catch on to this, as you read through the Bible, you're going to see this over and over and over again. God's sovereignty, God planned this from eternity past, but here's the human decision that implements it, side by side, without any comment as to how that all fits together. It's like two railroad tracks running down the same track, coming together somehow in eternity out there. He never separates them. But here's the deal. You and I can't do anything about God's choice, right? But we can certainly do something about our choice. So if you're wondering, am I chosen? Say yes to Jesus. And you will know that you're chosen. Those who are not chosen, what do they do? They harden their heart to God and they don't care. If you can honestly do that, then you are not chosen. You can't change God's choice, beloved, but you can change your choice. You'll never be able to stand before God and say it was your fault. Spurgeon said this, I believe in the doctrine of election because I am quite certain that if God had not chosen me, I should never have chosen him. And I am quite sure that he chose me before I was born or else he never would have chosen me afterwards. That's brilliant, isn't it? It's biblical too. He goes on, he says, and he must have elected me for reasons unknown to me, for I can never find any reason in myself why he should have looked upon me with special love. But if you're a Christian, he did. He came to seek and to save you. You belong to him because he's the initiator and he's the implementer of salvation. What a savior. Thirdly, he's the invader. He's the invader Zacchaeus, come down, for I must stay at your house today. Jesus' next step in bringing salvation, full-scale invasion. Man, this is a full frontal assault. He didn't just say, come on down, Zacchaeus, let's have a spot of tea. That wasn't it, right? Come down because I'm coming to your house. I don't care what it looks like. 
I don't care whether the living room is clean or not. I'm coming to your house. This is full-scale invasion, beloved. There's, no, there's nothing hidden there. There's no secrets. This is Jesus moving in, lock, stock, and barrel. This is Jesus invading. This illustrates another aspect of salvation, one that Jesus outlined previously in Luke 9, 23. Remember when he said, if anyone comes after me, let him or her deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. We like to ignore the daily part. Saving faith is a faith that goes from here to there. It's not just a one-time thing. This isn't just a brief visit and then back to normal. It's not a walk down the aisle and a short prayer and then business as usual. That is not saving faith. Salvation, beloved, is a new master in the heart. It's a new king on the throne. It's a new agenda in life. That's saving faith. That's how you know you have it. Things change. Thankfully, they change for the better. Billy Graham said this once. He said, when Jesus says, if you are going to follow me, you have to take up a cross, it's the same as saying, come and bring your electric chair with you. Take up the gas chamber and follow me. He did not have a beautiful cross, gold cross in mind, the cross on a church steeple or on the front of your Bible. Jesus had in mind a place of execution. Execution of what? Execution of self. Because that's the way we come alive to Christ. Is it painful to execute self? Absolutely. Nobody gives up control willingly or easily. I think about, you know, C.S. Lewis who said, you know how I got into the kingdom of God? I came kicking and screaming. Most of us do only to find out God had it right all the time. That it was the greatest exchange we ever made to die to self in order to come alive to him. We've misled so many of people on this. You know, we've told them just believe and then live as you like. One of the major seminaries was held up as a, as a, as a prime example when I was in school. About 40 years ago, suddenly began to teach it this way. You can come to Jesus as Savior now, and then you can come to him as Lord later on as you mature and if, if you decide you want to. And by the way, if you, if you decide you never want to, that's okay too. But it's not biblical. What did Jesus say? If anyone will come after me, let him, let him deny himself and let him take up his cross daily and follow me. What did he say in Romans 10, 9? If you will confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord. That means boss, manager, takeover. This is, a, this is not a hostile takeover. This is a great takeover, but it is a takeover. If you will confess Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's what it says. That's what saving faith is. He either invades all or he doesn't come in at all. Revelation 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears the door and invites me in, I will come into him and have dinner with him, basically, which meant in that society what? It meant intimate fellowship together. It meant a commitment I will come in and be part and parcel with him. But you've got to let him. So, so if you let him in, it's for good. I mean, you can choose not to let him in. But if you let him in, you're giving him the keys all the way across your heart. Tim Keller told in one of his sermons about a, about a woman who came to his church in New York City having been taught that God, you know, what we got to do to get right with God is be ethical and be good. And she was, you know, confessing how ethically she lived and how good she was. And then he began to explain the gospel to her that has nothing to do with how good or bad you are. All your good could never outweigh your bad. Your bad would condemn you. The thoughts you've had in your heart since you sat here in my office would be enough to condemn you. 
selfishness that you're displaying and saying that you can do it on your own and you don't need the Son of God who died for you. That alone would condemn you. It's by grace. And she said this. She said, that is a scary idea. Good scary, but still scary. He said, well, what's so scary about unmerited free grace? She said, well, if I was saved by my good works, there would be a limit to what God could ask of me. I'd be a tax collector with rights. But if I'm a sinner saved by sheer grace at God's infinite cost, then there's nothing he can't ask of me. That's right. That's right. That's what you do when you come in saving faith to him. Well, if there's no change of life, there's been no saving faith. Grace is scary. It means new management. But believe me, it's a glorious invasion. It's one you never regret. Never regret. Very few things you can say that about in life, aren't there? Here's one you can say that about. And if you've come to faith in Christ, it's because he was the initiator of your salvation. It's because he was the implementer of your salvation. It's because he has truly invaded your life. And he's done one other thing. He is also the indemnifier. He is the indemnifier. What in the world it is in an, an indemnifier? Those of you who work with, congreg- with contracts, you know what indemnification is, right? Indem- and indemnifier is one who pays the penalties. So you get into a contract and somebody wants an indemnification clause. What does that mean? It means they want you to pay the penalties if something goes wrong. Well, there's a, there's a penalty that has to be paid, beloved, because of sin. Our sin requires that. Jesus couldn't just show up on the scene and say to Zacchaeus, I will forgive your sins and I will save you without some payment being made for those sins. It was either exact the payment from Zacchaeus by eternal separation from God or God's plan which said, I will send Jesus not only to seek and to save, but to provide the indemnification for the sins of this human race. So the only reason God, through Jesus Christ, could offer salvation to Zacchaeus was because of what Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem to do, which was to provide indemnification. Jesus was going to Jerusalem to climb up the tree of the cross so that Zacchaeus come down from his tree, right? That's indemnification. Making the payment for getting the payment made. In Jerusalem, Jesus intentionally, purposely went to the cross so that he could do this. Back to to Isaiah again, 53, verse 5, but he was pierced. Why? For our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that has brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Jesus is the indemnifier, paying the price we could not pay so that we could have the life that we could not earn. November 26, 2008, there was a news story about a terrorist attack at the Taj Mahal Hotel in India. Terrorists had gotten into that hotel. They sprayed bullets everywhere killing 200 innocent people. There was there an Indian-born English actor who was having lunch with some friends in the restaurant there when the shots rang out. One of his friends pulled him down under the table. But later, the terrorist came walking through the whole restaurant, shooting at will, trying to kill everybody and make sure they left no one alive. Somehow this man came out alive. He was asked why. You know what he said? He said this. He said, I suppose it's because I was covered in someone else's blood and they took me for dead. That's exactly what Jesus did on the cross. I don't care what somebody else tells you that it was just an example, that it was just a tragedy of history. It was none of that. It was the means by which Jesus indemnified everyone who will come by faith 
to accept the forgiveness that is offered through Jesus Christ. He paid the price for your sin with his blood. Salvation was costly to God. Another writer, Trevin Wax, says it this way. He says, because Jesus said, I thirst, we can drink from the fountain of living water and never thirst again. Because Jesus said, woman, behold your son, and felt the pain of, of separation from his earthly family, we can experience the blessing of being united with a heavenly family. Because Jesus said, it is finished, our new life can begin because Jesus committed his spirit into the Father's hand, God commits his spirit into our hearts. Because Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We can say, my God, my God, why have you accepted me? And because Jesus hung on that tree, Zacchaeus could come down from his tree. And so can we. He's indemnified us. He's paid the penalty. It accrued to us because we have violated the character of a holy God. The old hymn writer said it so well, because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. Is that amazing? This is the amazing grace, beloved. If you're a Christian today, this is what you have in Christ. He's the initiator. He is the implementer. He's the invader. He is the indemnifier for you. So what is Jesus' part in salvation? Everything. 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 There isn't anything that it's not. That's why Jesus said in John 17, 3, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. When it comes to salvation, he is everything. D.L. Moody used to tell the story of a Civil War vet who was engaged when the war broke out. He and his fiance were obviously separated for the next three years. They wrote letters constantly, every chance they got, as did many during that horrible war. But after the Battle of the Wilderness in May of 1864, the letters stopped coming. And then, after a few weeks, here came this letter written in strange handwriting to the young lady. It said, we have fought a terrible battle, and I have lost both arms. A friend is writing this for me. I love you more tenderly than ever, but I can never support you and release you from your promise. I cannot ask you to join your life with this maimed life of mine. He got no letter back in return. Instead, that young lady got on the first train she could find, headed for Washington, D.C., where she knew he was in a hospital. She sought out his hospital. She found the row where he was in and the cot where he laid, and she ran to him and threw her arms around him, and she said, I love you not for your arms. I love you for who you are. I will not desert you. I will take care of you if you will only have me. It didn't take that young man very long to choose her all over again, right? Wouldn't you do that? Beloved, I heard you this morning. If you don't know Jesus, if you've never said yes to him, if you're worried about whether you're chosen or not, I don't know what your concerns are, I beg you on behalf of God, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5, be reconciled to God. I beg you, accept the only Savior you will ever have. He's the only way. When he stops at your place and calls your name, let him save you. The Bible says in John 10, the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, just like he did Zacchaeus. And he leads them out. Zacchaeus responded in faith when he heard his name because that was his day and that was his time and that was his place. Is today your time and your place?
in your name that Jesus is calling. Today, salvation has come to this house, Jesus said. Why had salvation come to that house? Because Jesus came to that house. He is salvation. This is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And you know what? If we're as believers, which I, I'm sure has characterized most of us here today, do you revel in the Savior that we have? Does this change your life? to think what he has done, the price he has paid to indemnify you and then to come to seek and to save you. Because if you're a Christian, that's why. It's not because you were so smart. It's because he loved you and he came to find you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this great salvation. I think how you said in your word, how should we escape if we neglect so great salvation? It's true. We see it. Savior, what you have done for us what you did for Zacchaeus. Our, uh, our experience may not be as dramatic as that of Zacchaeus, but it is no less saving. It is no less the same thing, just with slightly different circumstances attached. And so we thank you. We praise you from the bottom of our hearts. And Lord, if there's, for those who may not know you who are here today, would you help them right now in the quietness of their own heart to say, yes, I see it. I want it because I want him. I want the relationship with this dead and buried and risen Christ. I want to know him. So I give you my sin right now in exchange for your righteousness. Lord, may that be the case, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.